so let's get stuck into the 17th century then this yeah. period that we're both we're both keen on and i wonder if you could just give some you know political context uh for the period that you are that you're focusing on the, the 1650s could you just give us a give us a kind of kind of yeah. set the scene uh, i mean i can i will try and do it as, as briefly as i can right the, the period between sort of 1649 and 1660 is not a lot really that straightforward right yeah right so but to provide a very quick outline of the period and it's obviously going to inevitably lead to sort of some oversimplification um but, so we have Charles I, he's executed on the 30th of January, uh, 1649. The monarchy is abolished a week later and a republic is proclaimed in uh, March, 1649. Uh, and so for the next four or so, or so years, the English Commonwealth, uh, as it's known, was sort of governed by the Rump Parliament. And these were those MPs who had not been excluded from an event called Pride's Purge in uh, November, 1648. Right. Uh, when those MPs who uh, sort of wanted to carry on negotiating with Charles after the Second Civil War, uh, they were barred from entering Parliament, and that just left the MPs who were sort of more open to sort of having Charles I tried. So it was a run Parliament, and there was also a sort of Council of State, uh, a Council of State who acted as a sort of executive who sort of took on some of the responsibilities that were sort of uh, usually expected of the uh, the King and the Privy Council. So they governed, so the Rump Parliament governed from 1649 until, uh, well, the 20th of April, 1653, when they were forcibly dissolved by the army led by Oliver Cromwell right. for their sort of lack of reform and refusal to dissolve themselves and call for new elections. So after a brief interim then, Cromwell backed this proposal by uh, the fifth monarchist, uh, Thomas Harrison, who uh, I think we'll come to later, mm -hmm. uh, to form this sort of Parliament of Saints, or, or what came to be known as Barebones Parliament. It right. was named after uh, one of its um, members called Praise God Barebone. Right. Uh, and its members were handpicked by the army. Um, so this uh, parliament reigned from uh, July uh, 1653 until December 1653, mm -hmm. before it dissolved itself. Uh, as there were sort of divisions between sort of radicals and moderates over issues, um, I mean, notably tithes. Uh, so tithes were sort of taxes paid uh, to the church and right. to the clergy. So on it, uh, on the dissolution of uh, Barebones' parliament uh, by the sort of more moderate members of the assembly, they put power into the hands of Cromwell and he is installed as Lord Protector. So right. then from December 1653 until his death on the 3rd of September uh, 1658, um, Oliver reigned over a protectorate, which sort of, some historians have tended to see as sort of more politically stable uh, than the other sort of republican regimes okay. of the period. And so on his death, his son, uh, Richard Cromwell, acceded him, and he reigns uh, for about nine months before he was dis uh, deposed um, sort of unintentionally by his own brother-in-law, uh, Charles Fleetwood, and his uncle, John Desborough, who were sort of two of the uh, leading figures in the army. So this is where it gets very complicated. Mm -hmm. So in, we're in uh, 1659. So Richard's protectorate collapsed in April 1659. The Rump Parliament... Uh, the sort of first Commonwealth regime, Republican yeah. regime, they returned in May 1659 in a sort of uneasy alliance with the army until the army deposed them once again <laughs> in October 1659. And uh, although in the midst of this, there is a royalist uprising in, in August, which was sort of easily put down by the republics, and that sort of helped pepper over the cracks for a month right. or so. Um, and then the army decided to set up what is called a committee of safety, uh, made up of sort of army officers and its allies. Uh, but this didn't last long. And then the sort of um, commander of the army in Scotland, an individual called George Monk, yeah. sort of expressed his disaffection with the Rump's removal. And he marches down into London. So then the Rump Parliament gets restored once again, I think on uh, the 26th of December, 1659. Uh, Monk is uh, initially welcomed by the Rump parliament but they too fall out and then monk backs call for a return of the long parliament which was those mps yeah. who had been barred at pride's purge and did not support trying charles the first right so they get restored in february 1660 and it's really here where the sort of restoration of charles ii becomes right. inevitable since these mps were mostly aligned to a sort of monarchical form of, of government and then they then dissolve themselves in mid-March and new elections are called, which brings back a lot of royalists. Right. And then it's this new parliament known as the Convention Parliament uh, that finally restored Charles II, who is then proclaimed king on the 8th of May, 1660, and returned to England uh, later that month. 
so yeah, that's a that's a whistle stop tour. You. I mean, <laughs> thankfully my MA dissertation helped me uh, with the sixteen with sixteen fifty nine. Yeah, uh, that, that period always used to baffle me. I mean, the yeah. sixteen fifty itself used to baffle me at, at uh, A level. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, finally it, getting my head around it. <laughs> it's it's yeah. I mean, it's so that so much happening, and just the the idea that it goes back to, you know, the rump and the long part. You think those things yeah. are done, and it's like no, they're yeah. not. They're not finished. They're coming <laughs> back. You know. So yeah, thanks for that. Really, it's really, and I think key is the the role of the army there, isn't it? In in yeah. those those key decisions, um, and I think just just to kind of add on add on to that or kind of move on slightly is there's been a lot on the kind of failure of the republic um mm-hmm. as we said actually we talked about this a little bit before this idea of it kind of being inevitable and and just and, and kind of why it failed why it yeah. didn't last why it didn't work but what can you give us any idea of any kind of relative successes of the republic would you would you be able to give us any ideas about the ways in which it was successful if any yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. As I, I, as I sort of say in my thesis, you know, the focus really is on sort of its failures and sort of disaffection and resistance mm-hmm. toward regimes. But there's there's a lot of sort of successes. I mean, firstly, as, as a period as a whole, we can sort of point to the fact that the extent of religious toleration that took place uh, was pretty exceptional. Now, obviously, this needs to be caveated with what happened in other kingdoms, notably yeah. Ireland. Uh, given the sort of brutal campaign mm-hmm. launched against uh, its largely Catholic population. But even there, there's some sort of nuance to be had, and there are some sort of convincing arguments made by the uh, the likes of John Morrill on sort of Cromwell's willing- willingness to sort of tolerate Catholic worship in Ireland mm-hmm. privately in sort of uh, in the interest of political stability, let's say. Uh, and the same could be said in part for Cromwell's attitude towards Catholics in England, although there is at various times sort of laws that sort of hindered Catholics but again, these were sort of largely directed at royalists, uh, and Catholic and Catholics would sort of face, um, I would say, far worse sort of intolerance in the later periods of the 17th century. Right. Even under yeah. monarchs like Charles II, who who was more sympathetic to mm-hmm. uh, to Catholics, you know, his wife was yeah. Catholic and his mother was Catholic. Um, but England, there was a, in, in in England during the 1650s, there was a strong element of religious tolerance uh, that emerged uh, for Protestants, especially much more so than. Uh, than both its predecessors and successors, right? Right. From 1650, there was no longer a legal requirement to attend parish church each Sunday, each Sunday uh, so people could sort of choose where they worshipped. Uh, most Protestant sects were sort of tolerated, and by the standards of time, you know, England became an incredibly tolerant nation. Right. Um, so sort of Baptist and Congregation churches thrived in the 1650s. There was even discussions uh, to readmit the Jewish community, uh, Jewish community by uh, Cromwell in 1656, and to be able to practice their religion openly. Uh, and again, this should be sort of caveated, uh, since some of the most sort of radical dissenting sects were sort of treated with uh, a lot of hostility. Right. And there were acts passed, uh, like the uh, the 1650 Blasphemy Act. Yeah. Which was sort of aimed at um, aimed at some of the most disruptive sects, you know, uh, uh, such as the Durantes. Yeah, of course. On yeah. balance, uh, religious toleration during the 1650s was pretty exceptional. If we if we sort of take a more broader view across the 17th century, right. and then uh, you know, attempts at a sort of godly reformation by the Republic. So um, the, the Republic sort of attempted to sort of change the sort of moral behaviours of uh, of wider society. And that was relatively successful in some contexts. Um, So Bernard Capp um, has done a wonderful job in showing the sort of successes and failures of this attempt at a godly reformation and sort of providing a more sort of nuanced and balanced view uh, than than previous historians. So in places like York and Coventry, Gloucester and and so on, there were Mm. some uh, successful reformations, especially when there were sort of local magistrates, you know, people in, in local government who were willing to cooperate with the state in this. Uh, and Bernard Kapp has sort of shown that there's some su- successes in uh, things like curtailing Sabbath breaking and reforming the parish ministry. Uh, and we'll come to it later, but I would I would strongly recommend uh, uh, Kapp's book. It's called England's Culture Wars, where it sort of shows that in the context of which the republics were working, uh, there were a number of achievements. Um, I mean, another major success was the sort of republic's foreign policy. 
uh, especially under the Cromwellian protectorate. So this was something noted by contemporaries who would sort of talk about how the country's international standing and prestige right. was enhanced with a positive outcome uh, after its war with the Dutch. Um, and again, there were some failures, uh, you know, notably the Western design. So the Western right. design is uh, uh, the term used to describe the English expedition uh, against the Spanish uh, West Indies. Uh, and the English forces failed to capture uh, Hispaniola from Spain in 1655. But then there were also successes in Europe. So um, a joint Anglo-French force uh, defeated the Spanish at the Battle of Danes, uh, uh, sorry, at the Battle of Dunes. Uh, in 1658, which mm -hmm. uh, led to England acquiring the Port of Dunkirk, uh, and and some of you know some of the sharpest criticisms of Charles II uh, were sort of unfavorable comparisons made between his foreign policy failures uh, and the successes under uh, the republics. And on a more fundamental level, um, you know, it was highly successful in being able to sustain itself from from enemies. Um, on all flanks for so long. So the government in 1649 had threats from all sides, you know, mutinies from the levellers, uh, rebellion in Scotland and Ireland, there were forces sort of raised against the republics from its birth. Um, but forces under Cromwell were able to sort of subjugate uh, both uh, Scotland and, and Ireland, and, and as we know with Ireland with, with, with much barbarity. Mm. And then when Charles II uh, attempted to invade England, he was easily defeated uh, at the Battle of Worcester on the 3rd of September 1651. You probably note that 3rd of September is a very important date. Yeah. Uh, it's the same day that Cromwell dies yeah. as well. Uh, and there was numerous royalist plots throughout the 1650s, but none of them came anywhere near close to sort of toppling the government, largely uh, in part due to the fact they were, that they were never able to get widespread, uh, widespread support. Um, you know, even as Charles invaded coming down from Scotland, he expected the people to rise uh, and come to his side, but it, it never happened. Uh, and the intelligence system, uh, so it was first under a guy called Thomas Scott, and then more famously under uh, Cromwell secretary, uh, John Thurlow. Uh, yeah. uh, and it was a sort of highly sophisticated system and managed to deal with sort of plots uh, with incredible success. And at the same time, the republics were able to sort of get the European powers to accept its legitimacy as a republic while sort of isolating the Stuarts uh, in the process. Uh, and indeed, its ability to sort of legitimise itself and obtain and retain the support of its people uh, is something to be applauded. I mean, um, my second supervisor, Ed, made this really good point to me, uh, where he sort of reminded me that ideologically, since the republics had to deal with you know, a millennium of royal and clerical hegemony mm -hmm. over sort of ideas, the sort of alternative was always going to be more fragile. Uh, and I always think that's a sort of crucial yeah. uh, point to make when, when sort of considering the relative success of the republic, uh, republics. And I suppose it's a point that will come later. But in terms of its sort of lasting legacy, on one level, the sort of political and religious radicalism, uh, radicalism that emerged during uh, the 1640s and 50s demonstrated the, the sort of possibility of a new world. Uh, and this would come to serve sort of radical centuries later. You know, the, rep the republics ultimately collapsed, but the ideas live on. And then uh, something that is sort of well appreciated in academic circles, but perhaps less so to the sort of wider public. Uh, and it's a point made sort of quite convincingly by my by my first supervisor, Jason PC. And it's still, this sort of emergence of a wider uh, participatory political culture um, that sort of allowed individuals, you know, humble individuals, those usually excluded from formal sort of uh, politics, to sort of take an active role in shaping and indeed transforming the nature of politics of the period. And I suppose, you know, someone from the background, from my background, you know, low stock, so to speak, working class, so it takes much solace and, and mm -hmm. sort of derives inspiration from this. Um, you know, people are able to shape their sort of lies and the politics of, in, in which they're sort of surrounded by. Uh, and, I, and I really see that as sort of one of the, the most sort of defining legacies of the period. Right. It's really interesting. Um, I, th I think there's a couple of things you said there that, that really interest me. I think the, the, the religious toleration and godly reformation, the fact that mm -hmm. those things can happen both at the same time, I think is really interesting that, you know, you've got this idea of toleration, but also we would like you to, to be you know to yeah, worship so, in a certain way kind of, if that yeah. makes sense and then also you know when you were talking there it's something that I'd, i hadn't thought about ever this idea that perhaps we need to we need to change the question and not and not kind of you know why did it why did it fail but but why was it able to survive for as long as it did almost because it you know 
like you say, that the hegemony of, of monarchy, um, the, the threats, both internal, external, this idea about legitimacy, both in the eyes of this people, but also foreign foreign states and, and all of those things. It, that is really, that's a really, really kind of interesting uh, interesting insight there. So thanks so much for that. Really, it's, it's, it's making me think about this in a different way. So thank you. That's brilliant. Um, so, so the key figure kind of is, is looking, looking over this period and you've got, you've got, a uh, you know, a little, a little one of him on, on his, on your desk there, yeah. Oliver Cromwell. Um, yeah. Obviously, this is somebody you talked a bit there about his kind of actions in Ireland and somebody very, very kind of polarizing, divisive figure. And there's yeah. lots of kind of myths around Cromwell. I wonder if you could just talk through some myths and and, and yeah, what absolutely, you, what you yeah. Think about I mean, that. Uh, having said that about my sort of interest now in in ordinary people, my sort of interest in Oliver Cromwell now feels like a guilty pleasure. Uh, but it's something <laughs> that is uh, something that is very much at the sort of forefront of my sort of undergraduate and master's work. Uh, and of course, there's um, uh, uh, the publications of uh, a new volume of Oliver Cromwell's writing and, spe writing and speeches. It's a free volume that has uh, recently came out. So there's a lot of uh, great work happening on mm -hmm. Oliver Cromwell still. Um, so I suppose the first myth is that he was, um, there's, there's one myth that is sort of that he was king in all but name. Uh, and there, there continues to be a sort of historical debate over the extent to which sort of Cromwell became king in all but name. Um, I mean, one of the things that always annoys me is that in these short summaries of, of the 1650s, where they essentially state that, you know, it was Cromwell who executed the king and then he reigned over the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And it's just not true. I mean, he was right. just one of 59 signatories of uh, Charles I's death warrant. And while he did play a really important role in the execution of the king, you could argue that Henry Iton, so Henry Iton was his yeah. son-in-law, uh, that he was more of a sort of central figure in bringing about the execution of the king. Um, and I, I mean, Cromwell, for one, was not actually present in London when Pride Purse take place, uh, took place. Um, and then when the Republic was established, I mean, he was a leading politician and army officer. But the first couple of years, as I sort of explained in the sort of uh, political context, he was sort of away on military campaigns, right? So he played a, the critical role in dissolving the rump and then establishing barebones parliament. Yeah. It was only really when he became Lord Protector that he was the sort of undisputed sovereign, uh, the undisputed ruler. Uh, and the first written constitution, indeed the first written uh, constitution the country's ever had, that established the protectorate, um, that sort of put a number of checks and balances yeah. on, on on his powers. So the Council of State, for instance, had uh, a lot of control, for for example, on issues over finance, over the armed forces, blocking MPs from sitting in Parliament. Uh, and ultimately, Oliver, uh, in 1657, after much toing and froing, he... Uh, when he was offered the crown, he, he would ultimately reject it. Um, and, and this sort of stemmed from two reasons. One was his sort of religious convictions and his belief in providence. Uh, this is the sort of idea that God had made his judgment against the crown. Um, and also he faced sort of staunch opposition from the army and some of his closest allies, so the likes of uh, Charles Fleetwood and, and John Desborough and John Lambert. Um, but even the new constitution, um, the, the humble petitioner and advice is, is what it's called, that he did accept in 1657. Um, it came without the title of the king and it did give him more powers, but he still remained sort of constitutionally constrained and it didn't really make him any more uh, kingly, albeit his sort of second inauguration was much more sort of monarchical in tone. Right. And of course, there's a sort of strong debate over whether the protectorate sort of represented a monarchical regime. Um, now, I'd certainly agree that there were sort of monarchical undertones, especially when it sort of came to uh, legitimising uh, mm. protectoral authority. But like the Commonwealth regime before him, there was also an attempt to sort of move away from monarchical tendencies to sort of uh, create n a sort of new cultural traditions. Uh, and I'd also personally disagree with the sort of overtly civilian aspect of, of sort of the protector or the protector court, you know, the army uh, and leading army officers like Fleetwood and Desborough were still sort of influential in that sphere. Uh, and the army was a sort of constant visible presence uh, in the regime uh, and, and played a key role in sort of courtly events and right. procession. So I suppose that's the first myth. Yeah. You know, that Cromwell was this overarching king in all but name during the whole of the period. 
Um, I mean, another sort of famous myth that that tends to come around is is that he banned Christmas. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. And and this is a sort of more straightforward one. You know, in actual fact, the sort of first Christmas ban took place in in 1644 when an ordinance was passed, uh, brought forward by I think is an Edward uh, an individual named uh, Edward Harley. Um, and, and I think Cromwell was present at the debates, but he didn't play any like role of this. Uh, and, and and there'd already been a sort of strong current among Protestants sort of criticizing the celebration of Christmas, given that it's not rooted in scripture. Yeah. And so in 1645, when Parliament introduced this directory of public worship to sort of replace the Book of Common Prayer, Christmas and other festivals like Easter uh, uh, were not to was were sort of advised that, that they should be observed. And then in 1647, when there was the sort of uh, uh, the sort of outright ban. Yeah. I don't think Cromwell was actually present then. Um, so in, in the 1650s, Christmas did continue to be banned. Right. Uh, and Cromwell himself did sort of, sort of support the ban, but it's important to note that he was much more sort of lenient actually than others. Yeah. So um, there's a guy called Bullstrode Whitelock who was uh, one of sort of Cromwell's advisors, and he know uh, he has a, a famous diary. It's a really good source for the period. Um, and I think it's Christmas 1657 where Whitelock sort of uh, notes that when. Um, Cromwell was sort of advised to send soldiers to crack down on celebrations. Mm. Uh, he actually suggested sort of letting it slide. Right. And uh, he was pressured by others to sort of crack down on the celebrations given the sort of ordinances uh, passed against it. Um, and I suppose the third myth uh, is, is it which sort of feeds into that, is sort of the belief that sort of Cromwell was this sort of dour Puritan killjoy. Right. Uh, and I suppose this extends to Puritans more generally. I mean, a lot can be said to the idea that all Puritans dressed in sort of uh, dour black clothing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of famous individuals during the period, including uh, a number of Cromwell's close companions who, uh, you know, like to dress from Boitley. Um, Cromwell himself, I think, actually did prefer a sort of plain style. But he certainly wasn't a killjoy and is actually well known for his sort of sense of humour. And there's been some really interesting articles written about this. So he was obviously very pious and, and did spend sort of countless uh, hours sort of praying and reading the Bible and listening to sermons. Uh, but again, White sort of provides an interesting insight where he sort of talks about Cromwell spending time at Hampton Court, um, which is where he sort of went to on, on his weekend retreats. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's sort of stories of him like hanging out with his companions, playing bowls and smoking pipe. Uh, and it's said that the wedding at his uh, younger, uh, the wedding of his younger daughter uh, Francis, he sort of played a number of practical jokes and sort of took the wig off the groom uh, Robert Rich. And then there's a sort of famous story as a sort of way to lighten the tension um, over the signing of uh, Charles the First death warrant that he sort of splashed ink at sort of one of the other signatories. Uh, uh, the sort of Republican firebrand Henry Martin. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this sort of idea that Cromwell is this sort of boring, stern individual, which right. sort of still continues to sort of be there in the popular yeah. imagination is is not really true. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, you know, much more human than that. One thing that I'm particularly interested in, um, Wasim, and something that has come up in my teaching of this and, and reading of this period, which I think is it just kind of fascinates me is is this kind of explosion of radicalism in the period and i wonder if we, you've talked about it briefly but i wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about the reasons for that and the extent of that and and just yeah about kind of why this happened at this time yeah i mean i mean so as you say from the sort of throughout the sort of 1640s and 1650s there's this sort of explosion uh, of dissent of, of mm -hmm. sort of political uh, of political and religious radicalism that sort of came to the fore and, and can be understood to be sort of part of this political, uh, this increasingly sort of participatory political culture. And this was sort of helped along by the breakdown of censorship in 1641. Um, so that led to a sort of proliferation of print uh, and therefore sort of allowed the sort of spreading of, of more sort of novel ideas. Um, and then sort of the abolition of the episcopacy in, in late uh, 1641. So, you know, uh, the church hierarchy of bishops right. uh, and that was a sort of fundamental issue between the supporters of the king and, and parliament and that sort of helped to unleash this sort of wave of religious radicalism and the sort of parliamentary's cause failure to come up with an adequate settlement meant that these 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 radical groups sort of came to fruition so essentially there's a sort of collapse of state mechanisms like censorship religious court right. the episcopal hierarchy which sort of allows for unorthodox views to sort of disseminate into mainstream political uh, culture and i suppose the nature of political events over the course of the 1640s you know a, a civil war 
is sort of shattered society. Right. And inevitably, this led to more sort of transformational ideas over politics, over society. Uh, and these sort of ideas uh, began to get sort of wider acceptance among uh, more, more segments of, of society. And of course, this was sort of tied to religious notions. You know, important hero ideas around sort of millenarianism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea that the old world is collapsing and a godly regime is on the horizon. Uh, and this was a period of, of, of political change, of turmoil, of dramatic change, which sort of causes people to come up with sort of innovative, radical solutions to deal with extraordinary events that they are forced to deal with. Um, you know, traditional institutions, traditional systems, traditional beliefs are all sort of up for question uh, right. and up for debate. And sort of Hill, uh, Christopher Hill says, you know, this is a great period of, of political and intellectual excitement, a period where the old world could be transformed, right? Right. And, and all of this sort of constitutes a real radical revolution and sort of helps coalesce in to the execution of Charles I mm -hmm. and the establishment of a republic. And it left behind a sort of lasting legacy of, of practices and ideals both for sort of liberalism and socialism. Yeah. So to, to sort of touch upon some of the, uh, the most well-known groups, um, so I think uh, one of the most sort of famous ones is the Levelers. Yeah. Um, so they're a sort of broad movement that sort of pushed for widespread social, political and economic reform. They sort of play a key role in a, in a number of political events uh, in the period between the end of the, the First Civil War, which is in 1646, and the execution of the king in 1649. And they have a, a very strong influence in the New Model Army. Um, so, for instance, the Putney debates in uh, uh, late October to early November 1647, there's a sort of series of debates over how England should be governed, and the ideas the levellers express in um, the first in their first agreement of the people, and 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 that sort of discussed and in particular ideas over stuff like the extension of the franchise. Yeah. So when it came to sort of what the levellers were sort of championing and pushing for, it was it was policies and ideas, things which were you know, transformational, things like sovereignty, uh, like sovereignty lying with the people, you know, uh, religious toleration, the abolition of tithes, <clears throat> law reform, things yeah. like um, making sure that legal proceedings were were being done in English and and, and was more sort of straightforward for sort of more humbler folk to follow. Yeah. Um, there was a sort of call for a redistribution of seats. Uh, and a biennial parliament, so parliaments take place every two years, yeah. made up of one chamber, sort of consisting of a single elected house, which should be the sort of supreme authority in the land. And I mean, the fact that, you know, these political ideas are being debated is sort of truly revolutionary in itself. And of course, returning to this idea of a sort of increasingly participatory uh, political culture, their sort of programme opened up new vistas of political participation, and the Levellers held some of the sort of largest demonstrations and petitioning campaigns that had ever been held in the country, right? Um, and while the sort of Levellers only called on suffrage for men, women sort of played a key role in these activities. Yeah. So uh, they organised Britain's first ever all-women a petition for the release of level leaders that had been imprisoned in 1649, uh, and they managed to convince over 10,000 women to sign this position, which was, uh, sign this petition, sorry, which was then presented to the Commons. So the levelers are certainly historically yeah. uh, significant. Uh, and then we we have we have the Diggers, uh, another sort of well-known group led by uh, Gerald Wynne Stanley, uh, and so they were uh, a sort of radical uh, political and religious group who essentially proposed a sort of form of um, what some would consider agrarian uh, socialism, or some would even call a form of proto-communism, mm -hmm. with a sort of emphasis on uh, economic equality. I mean, their ideas stemmed from a sort of Christian belief in the sort of common ownership of the earth. So the diggers suggested that the earth was sort of given to them um, from God to sort of be shared equally and in common ownership. Uh, and in a sense, it was a sort of critique of private property. Yeah. And uh, in practice, they, uh, a group of them, led by Win uh, Gerard Wynne Stanley, occupied uh, St. George's Hill, ironically now one of the most expensive parts in the country, in, in Surrey, uh, and, and began to work the land, essentially. And it, and it only lasted a few months, and they were quickly put down by the, the New Model Army. But their ideas, again, proved the source of, sort of inspiration for the left, 
especially yeah. in the 20th century and the sort of key example of the nation's sort of radical past. Yeah. And then, of course, we have a number of religious radical groups that emerged during a period. We have fifth monarchists, Quakers, Muggletonians, uh, an increase in sort of Baptists and, and, about, and Anabaptists and Antinomians. And of course, the government in the 1650s was dominated by independent uh, or congregationalists, so those in favour of sort of religious toleration and who sort of favoured the idea that each congregation was autonomous in the sort of spirit of the early uh, Church of Christ's disciples. So it, I'll just touch upon uh, two religious groups, so mm -hmm. the, the fifth one and the Quakers. So the fifth monarchists, they sort of really took shape and became sort of more formalized, a, a more formalized emergence of sort of millenarianism in uh, 1651. But they had their roots sort of beforehand. And, and again, they had a strong uh, showing in the new model army. So millenarianism is this sort of belief uh, and, and one extending way beyond the fifth monarchists uh, sort of across the, the, the Protestant spectrum, you know, people like Cromwell certainly uh, believe this that the sort of end of the world was imminent yeah. and it sort of came from the book of revelations and, and people saw that the political crises um that were, had emerged during the period was sort of part of this event and that it would lead to a return of christ it would inaugurate this sort of a thousand years of rule by saints um and then the fifth monarchist would draw upon the book of david to say that you know fourth earthly monarchies would proceed uh, the fifth one uh, or the fifth one or the sort of establishment of the kingdom of god on earth um, and one of the most sort of interesting and important figures was was Thomas Harrison. Um, so he was the the individual who who, who pushed Oliver to set up that um, bare bones Parliament, the right. Parliament of States. So he's a he's a regicide, uh, and who was famously uh, famously the first regicide to be executed yeah. when Charles II was restored. So the Fifth Monarchy sort of largely opposed the Rome. They they sort of backed bare bones as Parliament and supported sort of sweeping religious reform. But then with this sort of establishment of the protectorate, most of them sort of went into opposition. And then there's a there's a sort of famous, um, uh, I'm oversimplifying here, but there's a sort of famous uh, 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 rebellion or sort of revolt uh, by a group of fifth monarchists um, who were sort of rebel against Charles II in yeah. 1661, uh, led by uh, Thomas Venner, uh, but that's sort of easily quashed by the government. Uh, and a lot of fifth monarchists then sort of, they remain part of the wider sort of dissenting community in the Restoration period, and then and then I suppose finally we have like the Quakers, um, who are a really fascinating group who who sort of emerged in the 1650s, uh, and they spread uh, they spread fairly rapidly across the country uh, as sort of Quaker leaders like James uh, sorry James George Fox yeah uh, toured the country and sort of picked up tens and thousands of supporters. Uh, and here, women uh, played a much more sort of prevalent role in the Quaker movement as, as sort of preachers and writers. Uh, and yeah, uh, you would sort of suggest that the, the Quaker movement was um, much more sort of equitable uh, towards women than sort of other groups in the period. And, and you know, women were welcome to speak openly in meetings and like uh, other denominations. And the focus for, for Quakers was this uh, sort of inward spiritual uh, spiritual belief rather than in sort of outward forms. Uh, and so for the authorities, they were sort of regarded as serious as a serious threat to uh, both the religious and social order. So they disrupted formal church services. They refused to doff their hats to superiors. They refused to take oaths. They abused the clergy. Um, and, they, and they also called for sort of social reform and, and took interest in things like poor relief. And I think one example that sort of encapsulates the sort of Quaker threat to the social order is one of its uh, leaders, James Naylor. He would ride into Bristol in 1656 on, uh, on the back of a donkey surrounded by women in a sort of reenactment of Christ's entry into Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And this was clearly seen as blasphemous and was met with sort of brutal severity by Parliament. Uh, again, a limit of sort of religious toleration and Naylor was viciously punished uh, and only sort of narrowly avoided uh, the death penalty. Um, but again, it was only really under under Charles II that he adopted a sort of pacifism in, in order to sort of survive. Right. Um, and one of, sort of the arguments uh, emphasised by historians is that um, the sort of threat posed by Quakers, especially its influence in the army in 1659, which sort of shook the political nation uh, and the sort of scared the country's traditional rulers, meaning that, um, you know, they thought that restoration of Charles II would sort of ensure that the social order wasn't overturned. And there was a strong influence of Quakerism in parts of the army, 
Uh, and it's, it's hard not to emphasize the sort of real threat that that Quakers posed to a, a large segment of the population during the 1650s. I mean, I'm, I've been reading a lot of sort of furlough state papers for the mm-hmm. thesis, and, and and sort of fears over Quakers is is is, um, is is quite prevalent. And indeed, the Republic regimes are seen as a sort of bulwark, despite being religious radical themselves. Mm-hmm. They're seen as a bulwark against radical sects like the Quakers. But as we know, the Quakers uh, would ultimately survive the sort of, despite intense persecution, especially during uh, the latter part of the 17th century. And, uh, and, and, and as we know, they, they remain a large religious group today. It's really fascinating just to hear why these groups grew and the kind of the impact of them. I think the Quakers particularly, yeah. uh, just, to be, just to be aware of the, the, the extent to which they were seen as a significant threat, I think is really, really interesting. So I think we need to talk about this question of kind of why the Republic failed and kind of whether the restoration was or wasn't inevitable. Because as we said, this is one of the kind of big, big, big issues when dealing with this period of the 1650s. So yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> so my my feet part of, well part of the thesis is sort of attempting to move away from sort of studying the 1650s through uh, a lens of its sort of supposed inevitable downfall, and mm-hmm. instead sort of trying to view it in its own terms. So, so I don't think personally that the restoration of Charles II was inevitable. Um, I think that one of the wider problems in the sort of historiography is the belief that the English republics were always doomed to fail, right. or that the republics can be sort of characterized as sort of failed states. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and people in the 1650s certainly didn't see it that way. Uh, there wasn't some sort of underlying belief that took hold of the population that thought that Charles's return was definitely going to happen. And I always go to the example of Edward Hyde, um, his remarks in 1658, where he states on uh, Richard's um, peaceful accession, uh, something along the lines of them being as far away from restoring the king as they have ever been. And this sort of idea that there was a sort of silent majority of people patiently praying for the return of Charles II, I think it's quite it's an unsubstantiated claim. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't wish to claim that a majority of people became sort of outright Republicans overnight. But I think, uh, as I think my thesis was sort of demonstrate that the Republics were able to draw upon sort of far more support than, than historians have previously recognised. And of course, we shouldn't forget that this was a, a period of real sort of transformational change. But in terms of sort of revolutionary upheaval, people, even those who sort of might not automatically be sympathetic to sort of radical changes, they always find novel ways in which to sort of accommodate themselves to these regimes in order to sort of ensure their own survival as well. 